Today we are going to look at chapter 14, probability. This is our first chapter on actual probability. Uh, this is going to be an introduction of sorts to, to some of the most basic probability. And so here we are going to look at uh, just a few, a little bit of vocabulary and kind of go from there. Probability is essentially how often we expect certain things to occur, right? In general, probability essentially is the number of outcomes uh, divided by, that we're interested in, number of outcomes we're interested in, divided by the total number of outcomes, period, right? And so let's define some of these words. Outcome is just, if I were to flip a coin, the outcome could be heads or tails. If I rolled a die, the outcome could be one, two, three, four, five, or six. It's literally what what happens uh, each time we, we run uh, an event uh, or a roll a die or we have a trial kind of depends on the situation. A trial would be a certain event occurring. Uh, in this case, a trial would be rolling a die or maybe if I'm going to be saying I'm going to be rolling five die, right? So I'll roll it five times and that trial would consist of a number of different things. Uh, a trial is essentially a collection of events that we want to talk about and it concludes uh, uh, one thing that we're looking for or something to happen. An event could be like rolling a die and flipping a coin. And I would say if I were to roll a die, write that value down and flip a coin, those two events, I could have two different events kind of collecting together to be my full trial. Um, in this case, my example would be rolling a die and predicting if it is odd or even, right? The event, in this case, would be getting an odd or even, depending on what it is. And the trial would simply be rolling the die each time. The outcome that is interesting uh, that I'm gonna write down is what happens each time, right? Each time I roll the die. And so we would say, uh, obviously, the, the possibilities there would just be rolling the one through six, the outcomes we went through six. Uh, each trial, in this case, was the roll of a single die. I could have made that rolling five, a die a number of times. Uh, the event would be, what's the probability of getting an odd or an even, right? Uh, you could pick one of those. Uh, obviously, getting an odd or an even combined would be 100%, right? A die is going to land on at least one odd or an even number. But if we kind of looked at it one at a time, what's the probability of getting an odd number? What's the probability of getting an even number, right? So those would be my events that we are looking at. In this example, uh, we're going to talk about the law of large numbers, which is one of the biggest uh, ideas in statistics. We talk about the law of averages sometimes, and a lot of people want to imply the law of averages is something that it is not, right? So law of averages here. Uh, in other words, if I flip a coin, if I flipped a coin in front of you and I got heads 10 times in a row, a lot of the time people tend to feel like, oh, if, they, if I had gotten heads 10 times, then I am more likely to see tails show up because I've gotten 10 heads in a row. And that is absolutely 100% false, assuming you have a fair coin. Every single time I flip that coin, it's like I've never flipped it before. We call this independent events. The event that previously has happened will have no impact on what happens in the events that are coming in the future, right? That can't ever happen. And so here, when you think that it's supposedly going to happen because of what's going on in the past, if, if that were true, then you have a dependent situation. Now, if I'm going to flip a card, if I'm going to pull a card out of a deck, I'm trying to find an ace, and I keep flipping cards out, and I, I don't see aces, I am a lot more likely to see an ace every time I flip that card over, and I, I don't see one coming, right? That's true, because that's a dependent situation. There's a story, you think your book talks about this, there's a game called Kino. This is an electronic game that uh, pops up a number of values, and if you guess those values, then you get money for as many as you can match up. I think you get a choice of 10 numbers and uh, you have to choose from 1 to 80 and if your numbers match up you win a value. Well a few uh, 
mathemat mathematicians from, from a, a popular school decided to study gambling and probability and see if they could kind of make their winnings uh, using math instead of just chance and luck. So what they did was they walked into a, 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 I guess it was a bar, I'm not sure where it is, and they went and they sat down and they didn't play Keno, but they did write down every number that won over the course of several days. They went back and they looked at a histogram of the winning numbers and they noticed something very unique. Now if it's a fair game, we would expect every single number in this, so 1 through 80, to be really kind of a uniform distribution. Every number should come up about the same amount of time, right? Uh, especially if you had a large enough sample. Large, large numbers says that uh, the larger the sample you get, the more precise my, my statistics are. In other words, the closer my statistics get to the true parameters. So what they noticed was that certain numbers in the list became more were more popular, they occurred more often than they should have. And what they did was they went back into that Kino uh, bar and they bet everything on those specific numbers. Now did they win every time? Absolutely not. But over the course of the next day and after winning about $50,000 they were asked to leave because they had broken the system and figured it out. Now this is a computer game so clearly this is a set of pseudo random numbers. Right? And if the algorithm isn't that great, well, your randomness won't be that great either. And these guys figured that out. Right? So, here uh, it's due to happen. That's the, the false sense of averages kind of showing up. That, that's not true. Right? Uh, the law of large numbers just says that the longer you do something, the larger your sample gets, the more likely you are that your statistics get closer and closer to your parameters, right? The law of averages is not the same thing as the law of large numbers at all, right? Um, the law of large averages, the way that we're, we're implying it here, that's not even a thing, right? If they're independent, it doesn't matter how often it's happened, right? Another example would be, oh, we've had, you know, uh, seven girls in a row. The doctor says, well, you've had seven girls in a row. You are definitely more likely to have a boy this time around. No. No, 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 not at all, right? Maybe genetics has got something to do with that. Um, so remember, if they're independent events, the outcomes that have previously happened have no impact. They will not change the probability of any events that, that, that follow them. And that's really, we're really looking at two things here. Law of large numbers, getting my statistics to be closer and closer to the right number, the actual parameter, and independent events. So, formal probability, a little few, another few things, right? So, we always use the phrase 50-50, and what that means is that if you have two outcomes, they are both equally likely to occur, right? Flipping a coin, you have a 50-50 chance of getting uh, heads or tails because they're equally likely. Probability, okay? So, a little bit of detail about probability. Number one, the probability's value will occur from zero to one inclusively. It can be zero, meaning never going to happen, or one being guaranteed to happen. Uh, it cannot ever be a number outside of that. Probabilities are always written as a decimal or zero or one. Um, you can talk about a percentage, right, but we know that numerically those values need to be between zero percent and 100 percent, never outside of that range. So the decimal, the proportion really is always a percent, a decimal point. For example, um, or not for example, but next part is sample space. This is the list of all possible outcomes. If I am uh, working on flipping a coin, if I flip a coin one time, then my sample space would be just heads and tails. Literally both, both of those things because that is every list of possibilities. If I flip a coin twice, right, then we have a number of things that could happen. If I flip a coin twice, I could get heads, heads, I could get heads, tails, or I could get tails, heads, or tails, tails. This, this list is the sample space for flipping a coin twice, right? It's not just about what could happen on one trial, but it could, what could happen over the course of my full trial, whatever it consists of, if it's flipping a coin twice, if it's rolling a die and flipping a coin, I have to write on every possible combination. 
The next part would be the complement. Uh, an event, like let's for example saying, what's the probability of drawing a red card from a standard deck, right? The complement of that would be not getting a red card. In this case, a black card, right? Because we have either red cards or black cards in a deck, a standard deck. So the complement is the probability of getting a, a, the event that it's not occurring, right? Whatever that happens to be for your example. Really, if we write out the formula, the probability of an event is equal to P of A, then the complement is equal to 1 minus that probability. That's the probability that the other thing doesn't happen. In this uh, slide, we're going to look at the addition rule. Something that's important here to note, we're going to see a couple things here. And this, uh, this word disjoint, this is also known as mutually exclusive. What that means is that when we're looking at two events, those events are uh, disjointed in the fact that they do not share any outcomes. For example, getting a 3 or getting an even number when we roll a die are considered disjointed or mutually exclusive. It means getting a 3, obviously, that's the only way it can happen. It's a 3. Getting an even number would be 2, 4, and 6. Because those two values do not have anything in common, we would say that they are disjointed. If we have two events that are disjointed, then this formula is allowed to be used. If those events are not disjointed, for example, getting an ace or a red card, right, with a, with a deck of cards, that's not the case, right? We have two aces that are also red, so that those two events can occur at the same time. That formula would fail uh, to work on that kind of situation. But, just to illustrate how the formula works, the example is, what's the probability of drawing an ace or a king. Notice we said the word or. The symbol looks like this. We call that the union. The way we work that out is you find the probability of each one and simply add them together. So the probability of A, of course, is the ace. Four out of 52 tries would get me an ace. The same thing for king because there are also four kings out of 52 cards. Simply, simply add those things together and we would have eight out of 52 or if you simplify that down to two out of 13. This rule works for any kind of scenarios where we're going to be adding or finding the, the concept of or, right? I want this thing or this thing to happen. Uh, with the opposite of this would be and, and that would be like looking for two things to occur uh, at the same time or in two events back to back. Speaking of the word and, the multiplication rule. For this one, we have what we call independent events. Be very, very clear. Independence and disjointedness are not the same things. They're not even in the same ballpark. Most students have a very difficult time distinguishing between those two things. If I were you, I would pay very careful attention to the definitions of independence and disjointedness. Just to clarify, independent outcomes means that when we have an outcome that happens, the result of that, in, uh, that event does not influence or change the probability of the other outcome. For example, if I were to say what's the probability of drawing an ace uh, in the first two draws of a deck of cards. If I left it at that, the next thing that should happen would be another question. Well, did you put the ace back in? Did you replace it? Because if I did, then I made it independent and I can definitely do it like we can here. If I kept the card out, then the probability of me drawing the second ace would depend on what I got the first time, right? So that makes it dependent, right? For now, we're gonna stick to independent events and disjointed events, just so we can kind of get the lay of kind of like how it works. We're gonna keep the training wheels on for a little while, and when we get to chapter 15, we're gonna take them off, and we're just gonna let it go. For now, let's consider independent events only. The question would be, what is the probability of drawing an ace and a red card, right? So with two draws of a card, we will be replacing the card. What would, it, what would the probability be? Well, this is the symbol for the intersection, all right? That was the, another way of saying and. We would do, well, there's four out of 52 chances of getting an ace. There are 26 out of 52 chances of getting a red card. Therefore, two draws of the deck with replacement would be 4 out of 52 times 26 out of 52. 
uh, basically turns out to give us 0 0.0059. That's essentially just over half a percent. All right, if we move the decimal two times, that would give us that percent, right? So 0 0.0059 would be the probability of getting a, an ace and then a red card. And that really takes us to the end of the notes for this section. Make sure that you pay special attention to independence and disjointedness and how you use the problems. Right? The assignment is just to work on that chapter 14 set of problems. Uh, really, you're, I wanted you to look through just the front page, one through eight, and we will talk about the rest tomorrow. Mm -hmm.